Thank you very much um, for that kind introduction. Uh, I want to thank Professor Nishipoglu and the Aga Khan program, uh, as well as Professor Gilsdorf and the Medieval Studies Committee uh, for the invitation to be here today. It's a pleasure and an honor uh, to be able to share my work with this audience in particular and to see um, many old friends in the audience as well. All right, can you hear me? Um, all right. So the Great Mosque of Cordoba, founded in uh, the late 8th century and expanded and embellished over the course of the Umayyad reign, is the outstanding testament to the architectural patronage of this dynasty on the Iberian Peninsula. Yet, as the 10th century Umayyad palace city of Medina Tazahra, west of Cordoba's walled center, illustrates, the Great Mosque was but one monument in a larger program of Umayyad patronage in and around their capital city. Just a couple of views of Medina Tazahra for you. Beginning in the second half of the 8th century, according to the Cordoban court chronicle, the Umayyad rulers and members of their court also founded estates within the roughly 13 kilometers uh, uh, zone west of Cordoba's walled center in which Medina Tazahra was also located. Uh, and these numbers on this uh, map indicate uh, the archaeological sites that uh, are believed to be these villa sites. The court chronicle provides a basic definition of uh, the munya or uh, the villa, as I have been calling it, a luxurious residence and extensive gardens. That the villa was a signal element uh, in the suburban landscape of the city is evident from the material that has been unearthed to date. The archaeology shows that Cordoba's fertile western plain, bounded by river and mountain, boasted an entire suburban landscape of villas, which in part should be seen as the continuation of pre-Islamic patterns of land usage, but which also speaks to significant investment in the natural resources available. The decimation of the Umayyad capital and its environs during the turbulent period of political and social upheaval that marked the disintegration of Umayyad rule in the early 11th century initiated the erasure of these estates from the city's landscape. With the Castilian conquest of Cordoba in 1236, subsequent changes rendered the Umayyad structures unrecognizable and over time, the structures fell into neglect and decay. They are scarcely known by architectural historians because they survive and are visible today as decontextualized fragments in the suburbs and in the warehouse of Cordoba's archaeological museum. So I'm just showing you uh, just four representative uh, fragmented remains of munyas, um, especially the carved fragments from uh, the Rusafa site, which was supposed to be the first of the Cordoban Umayyad villas. Those are just a few paltry fragments from what are literally um, dozens and dozens of milk crates in the warehouse of the Cordoba Archaeological Museum of fragments that have been excavated from that site. So very decontextualized, fragmented uh, remains. As I hope to show, these estates were an integral aspect of Cordoban Umayyad art, architecture, social life, and political identity, whose importance in the Umayyad period stands in contrast to their present <coughs> invisibility in the city's landscape. So I will begin by introducing some of the material evidence that helps us understand the architecture and spatial character of the Munya and its relationship to the dynasty's celebrated luxury arts. I will then outline some of the major social functions they served for the Umayyad court, focusing especially on munyas as sites of feasting, diplomacy, and civic processions. Finally, I will discuss how um, landscape, architecture, and material culture combined in these villas to articulate Cordoban notions of sovereignty and caliphal authority. As I hope to explain, after the declaration of the Cordoban Caliphate in 928-29, 
The Munoz took on a heightened official character as the settings for elaborate court events and became the political face of the dynasty, transforming these villas into dynamic <laughs> venues for the articulation and display of Umayyad sovereignty and one means by which the Umayyad rulers expressed their claim to caliphal authority. While the Munyas are all but invisible in the landscape of Cordoba today, enough evidence exists in the archaeological record to provide a sense of these estates as architectural complexes. Our best evidence comes from the site known as Arumania, situated in the foothills of the Sierra Morena mountain range a few kilometers west of Medina Tazahra. It has been identified as the Munya of the Slav freedman Duri Asarir, who supervised the Umayyad ivory workshops that produced some of the most celebrated works of Cordoban luxury arts, and about which I will say more in a moment. Excavated in 1911 by the archaeologist Velázquez Bosco, shortly before he began the first systematic excavations of the nearby royal city, Rumania consists of four rectangular uh, terraces that ascend the slopes of the mountain range. Impressive remnants of the monumental stone walls that enclosed the terraces and substructures, as well as the remains uh, of this monumental pool that you see here uh, and here uh, on the plan, uh, remain uh, and are visible today. It's the only munya uh, left in Cordoba for which we do have uh, substantial uh, remains in situ, so that makes it quite important for, uh, for our understanding of these sites as actually architectural sites. A visualization of the architectural complex based on Felix Arnold's ongoing German Archaeological Institute campaign offers a sense of the building's overall spatial organization, including the relationship between garden terraces and residential and other structures. A portal located at the southeast corner of the lowest terrace, uh, so here on the plan, provided access to the interior of the walled complex, leading visitors to a series of ramps ascending the terraces along the eastern wall. The importance of the garden to the overall scheme can be gauged by the large proportion of open to built space within the walled enclosure. While the residents and other structures uh, are um, situated on the uppermost uh, terrace here, the remaining three-fourths of the site is taken up by the garden terraces. The relationship of the architecture to the gardens was one in which views of the terraces and movement around their perimeter were privileged over movement within and through the cultivated spaces. The interior ramp situated along the eastern wall displaces the viewer to the edge of the garden, ascending alongside on the way to the residence, from where vistas of the garden and the river valley outside the walls could be taken in. Uh, so this path through the portal uh, and at the margin of the garden, this path of ascent up to uh, the structures at the topmost terrace. The archaeological investigation of the garden terraces corroborates the impression of the primacy of views and of circulation around rather than through the garden. At present, uh, at present no evidence of paths or water features such as fountains has been unearthed that would suggest any formal infrastructure, at least, for accommodating human presence in the gardens. Furthermore, the preliminary analysis suggests a soil better suited for fruit-bearing trees than for flowers, an impression subsequently confirmed by evidence that the terraces were planted with rows of olive trees with vines likely planted around the perimeters. So this picture of productive cultivated terraces uh, corrects the notion derived from later Andalusi poetry of Munoz as primarily these uh, pleasure gardens, these sites of uh, flowers and tinkling fountains that we uh, really get this impression of from uh, much later poetry. The axial arrangement of the terraces, 
the elevation and the tight cubic massing of the residential structures and the pavilion's visual connection to the surrounding landscape bespeak a highly formal conception of the villa's relationship to nature. The uppermost terrace featured a rectangular complex consisting of three basic parts arranged along an east-west axis. So starting from the east end, uh, these consisted of service uh, quarters here, uh, probably stables uh, and storage rooms, followed by the residence uh, proper here, consisting of a central pavilion with a central double reception hall connected to its west to residential quarters and what was likely a bath complex. The central pavilion's plan is organized around a wide <coughs> double reception hall whose rear chamber would have been shielded from extremes of hot or cold and which would offer the patron and his guests a sheltered interior reception area. During the recent archaeological investigations, archaeologists discovered a second suite of rooms south of the monumental pool. Uh, so this is that space here which was unknown uh, in 1911 when the original excavations were carried out. So this second suite of rooms uh, located south of the monumental pool. Um, looking south, a viewer enjoyed within uh, panoramic views of the villa's garden terraces and the fertile countryside beyond the Munya's stone walls. Uh, so these are the lower terraces today, uh, the view south from that uppermost terrace and the situation of, uh, of this um, pavilion that overlooks the monumental pool and the southern terraces. To the north, one would have enjoyed views of the monumental pool surrounded by a perimeter walkway artfully suspended over the water on ma massive stone buttresses, so you can see um, those buttresses uh, supporting the perimeter walkway here. <clears throat> the juxtaposition of surfaces, solid and liquid, was made even more dramatic by the suspended walkway extending around the perimeter of the pool. The contrast between nature and artifice, evident in the arrangement and appearance of the Munya's exterior, was further emphasized within in smooth whitewashed walls surrounding the enormous pool, creating, in effect, an interior courtyard in which water unexpectedly replaces a central paved space. The play of the water's reflection upon the smooth white walls of the space must have created dramatic effects of light and shadow, further contributing to the play between interior and exterior. Likewise, the flow of water from the monumental pool to the lower terraces would have been accomplished via the arcaded hall to its south, so that water would have appeared to flow from the hall down to the garden terraces. Uh, so, um, interestingly enough, what the excavations, recent excavations, have shown is that this uh, monumental pool, as large as it was, uh, would have been filled uh, with one good rainfall. It would have been filled. Uh, and after that, there was a system uh, here underneath this hall by which water from that monumental pool would flow down uh, and from there uh, irrigate <coughs> those lower terraces. Only a few fragments of architectural decoration have been unearthed from the Rumania site, but what they lack in quantity, uh, they make up for in interest. These consisted of fragments carved from white uh, or gray marble, which uh, in both materials and in their uh, formal qualities and in the level of craftsmanship uh, are comparable to the decoration at the Royal Palace of Medina Tazahra uh, from the same time period. Um, other fragments consisted of, um, or uh, these consisted of fragments carved from white or gray marble, which indicate that the decorative program at Arumania was characterized not only by the ubiquitous fields of vegetal ornament common to Umayyad architectural ornament, but by the unusual presence of animal imagery. 
So here within the edge uh, formed by the vine, you see these four uh, plump birds that are following one another, uh, beak to tail, uh, and following this uh, one larger bird whose head projects beyond the border of the volute roll. The exterior surface of the volute's roll is ornamented with a scrolling vine and flower and incised rope border with a single lion's head uh, portrayed frontally, protruding in relief from the surface. Uh, and I should say that these fragments were also unearthed uh, probably in, uh, that, um, in that hall that looks over the pool and looks over the southern uh, terraces. Animals are likewise the most striking decoration on the white marble uh, water basins that have also <coughs> been unearthed at the site. So in the small basin on the left, you have these felines uh, who gaze over their shoulders at their own curling tails and who are separated from one another by a horizontal band of curling feathery fronds supporting alternating lions and gazelle heads. A basin fragment bearing animal imagery as well as epigraphy bears the heads of two confronted animals depicted in profile with almond-shaped eyes, blocky snouts, and sharp teeth. A whole basin may have been part of the villa's bath complex. The presence of the decoration on all four sides of the basin indicates that it was meant to be viewed in the round rather than mounted against a wall. Lion's heads resembling those decorating the aforementioned volute appear at the point where the leaves divide in two, alternating uh, with the heads of a gazelle. The creatures carved in marble which animated the munyas uh, these birds, lions, and horned gazelles of Arumania have their closest parallels in the decoration of a group of ivory caskets likely produced during Duri Asarir's tenure as director of the ivory workshop at Medina Tazahra. The ivories were among the most prestigious objects made for or distributed among members of the Umayyad court and distinguished recipients outside Cordoba. This imagery on the ivories of lush vegetation, abundance of animals, and court pastimes such as music and hunting should be understood against the backdrop of aristocratic uh, villa culture. Which was closely connected with agriculture, the seasons, and the significance of a flourishing landscape to articulate caliphal legitimacy. Such imagery would certainly have evoked the literary representations of good governance and caliph legitimacy as they were articulated in Cordoban court literature of the period. The conceit of nature versus artifice would have been particularly striking within the pavilions, where the highly formalized vision of nature embodied in the animals and dense fields of vegetation carved in white marble on wall panels capitals and perhaps the fountain basins would have been juxtaposed <coughs> with framed views of the landscape beyond. <coughs> the correspondence between the aesthetics of a Munya architectural setting and the visual language and functions of the ivory containers, which would have formed a part of the decor perhaps in the villas of the elite, suggests that architecture, textiles, objects, and landscape work together to create an integrated visual effect. Cordoban Munya culture with its emphasis on agriculture and activities associated with refined court culture thus provides the broadest background against which to understand the themes that characterize the Cordoban ivories. Furthermore, because the Munya was central to Umayyad court life, the luxury objects like the ivories but also uh, tableware and the objects associated with precious fragrances which make up such a large part of the material culture of 10th century Cordoba take on heightened significance when considered in conjunction with the architectural settings and the social contexts in which they were used, displayed, and enjoyed. It is to that heightened significance of the Munya in the articulation of Cordoban sovereignty uh, that I want to turn now. So I'd like to show you 
uh, a timeline, uh, it might be difficult for you to, uh, to make out exactly what's on this uh, timeline. But in this one, uh, these are events taken from the Chronicle, the Cordoban Court Chronicle, uh, events that mention uh, Munoz. And so it's quite striking to see uh, how early the first Umayyad royal Munya, Rusafa, was founded early in the reign of Abdurrahman I uh, before the great mosque of Cordoba, according to the chronicler. Uh, and then how regularly it is part of uh, court culture during the period of the Emirate, but especially after the declaration of the caliphate, as I'll come back to. The villa, as James Ackerman observed, is not limited to any particular architectural type, culture, or historical moment, but rather is a social and an ideological phenomenon discernible throughout history. By the time Abdurrahman III reclaimed the caliphate for the Umayyad dynasty in the 10th century, suburban aristocratic villas and gardens were, along with the urban palaces of Cordoba and Medina Zahra, the preeminent stage upon which Andalusi Umayyad court culture was presented and performed. And so these are uh, the same, um, but uh, occurring after the declaration of the caliphate in 928 and 929. Uh, and when we look at the kinds of events that are occurring at Munoz after the declaration of the caliphate, we really see this um, heightened official nature of, of the Munya. Um, diplomatic receptions, official court feasts, uh, and in fact feasts at which a larger segment of the population was uh, invited into the Munya. Uh, so we start to see the Munyas taking on uh, a more official, uh, uh, quote unquote, more public uh, kind of face. The extent to which the Munya had become the court of an expression of an international Islamic notion of refinement and cultural capital and the way in which the Munya was then tied to Umayyad ideals of political authority and good governance is evident in the increasing visibility of the Munya as a setting for official state events, and not simply pleasurable court retreat. After 928 and Abdurrahman III's assumption of caliphal authority, the Munyas appear in the court chronicle as spaces central to the articulation and display of Umayyad kingship a string of increasingly formal, elaborate state events, such as political feasts, were held within Munya walls. The years immediately following the declaration of the revived caliphate witnessed the full integration of the Munya into official court life when they offered an alternative to the old urban palace in Cordoba. The suburban villas became the political face of the revived Umayyad Caliphate. And in this respect, I think it's interesting, um, and I only remembered this uh, today as I was uh, thinking about my talk, but it's interesting to think about uh, the earliest references to Medina Tazahra in the Umayyad court uh, chronicle. The chronicler refers to um, the royal city actually as the Munyat of al-Zahra. So um, we can maybe think of uh, that royal city in its earliest conception as one of these estates, which then uh, eventually grows to the size of a city or to become a city. The Munoz took on an intensified diplomatic role, housing a succession of foreign ambassadors from the Byzantine and other courts with whom the Umayyad sought political alliances to support their new aspirations. Internally, the Munyas become increasingly visible to viewers beyond the upper reaches of the court. By the time of Al-Hakam II's death in 976, the Munyas had been fully incorporated into the official civic rituals of the Umayyad state. The clearest expression of the trend toward this more official Munya is the use of villas for court feasts and civic processions. The reasons behind this shift in the Munya's functions and character are intimately linked to the flourishing landscape of Munya's gardens and their associated material culture. In the bid for caliphal legitimacy, the Umayyad rulers used architecture, landscape, material culture, ritual, and court literature 
to fashion a powerful statement of political authority and good governance within the sphere of international and regional politics and court culture. The great 14th century intellectual Ibn Khaldun wrote that feasts were one of the most important means, along with the construction of monuments, by which medieval Islamic dynasties manifested their power. Viewed in this light, much of the material culture of Umayyad Cordoba acquires a new dimension when viewed with the munya in mind. It seems to be no accident that so many of the surviving luxury objects attributed to Umayyad Cordoba are the kinds of objects that would have been employed during banquets to display and serve the foods, drinks, and to hold the fragrances which were so central to the practices of dining. Court feasts served as opportunities for rulers and aristocrats to display wealth, generosity, refinement, and of course their social status within court hierarchies, as well as to visiting diplomats housed in Munoz during their stay in the Umayyad capital. Within the confines of rich villas like Arumania, the Andalusi sovereigns and their most privileged courtiers and foreign ambassadors consumed foods, fragrances, cosmetics, and pharmaceuticals whose consumption within their walls was an integral part of aristocratic self-fashioning. Ibn Khaldun's observation suggests an ideological element to the luxury goods associated with the Umayyad court, like the famous Medina Tassahra ceramics, many, so many of which are marked with the epigraph al-mulk, or sovereignty, or power. A great number of these wares have been unearthed in the royal quarter of the upper terrace of the palace city, as well as in Cordoba's western suburban zone, where concentrations of such finds may indicate the presence of Munya remains. The ceramic wares have attracted scholarly attention as the Andalusi answer to Abbasid and Fatimid luster wear. But while on a technical and formal level, the Andalusi mulk wares do not compare with the quality and visual refinement of the Abbasid or Fatimid luster wear, uh, the latter, incidentally, which was imported uh, and has been unearthed at Medina Zahra along with imported uh, Chinese porcelains, it may be that the Cordoban ceramics resonate with greater social and political meaning than has thus far been recognized. Scholarly consensus holds that the epigraphy on these ceramic wares was primarily religious in meaning. The term mulk appears in the Quran four times, a reference to divine sovereignty. Uh, so to God alone belongs uh, mulk or sovereignty. But it would be a mistake to dismiss the handling of the epigraph on these ceramic wares as simply a shorthand for the longer pious phrase. It is significant that the entire phrase does not appear on these Cordoban wares. If that had been wanted, it would have been a simple matter for the artisan to include it. Instead, what's striking about these Cordoban wares is the visual emphasis on a single word monumentalized in Kufic calligraphy and centered upon the surface of the dishes uh, and great shallow bowls and ringing these closed vessels. Given that sherds of these ceramics have been unearthed in the area believed to be that of the caliphal residence at Medina Tazahra, certainly the message or messages of these mulkwares would not have been lost upon the others gathered at the Umayyad court banquets who would have used the ceramics and who were, after all, the intended internal audience. <coughs> the importance of this particular word to the Umayyads and their explicit connection of sovereignty and feasting can further be inferred from an unusual metalware bowl that was unearthed at Medina Tazahra, featuring the al-mulk epigraphy in a band circling its rim. Its shape, the appearance of the alloy, and aspects of its decoration identify this bowl as a high tin bronzeware, likely made in Khurasan or Afghanistan between the 8th and 10th centuries, and not commonly found outside Iran and Central Asia. The alloy would have had an appearance like gold when new, 
and its value as a luxury ware was considerable. The use of al mulk on the rim of this metal bowl reinforces the impression conveyed by Medina Tazahra ceramics of a conscious and pervasive message of Umayyad sovereignty borne by the objects of court feasting. The prominence of al mulk on these objects of the Cordoban feast points at least as much, if not more, to the political valence which the term acquired in post-Quranic usage as its religious one. Under the Syrian Umayyads, mulk came to signify earthly kingship and the institution of the caliphate, a political concept with which they were particularly associated and an association that was not necessarily positive from jurists' perspective. Nevertheless, perhaps it is this link with the Syrian Umayyad Caliphate and its political valence in the 10th century that Abd al-Rahman III sought to revive to underscore the legitimacy of his claim to the Caliphate. As Nuha Khuri and Geraldine Dodds have argued, this is certainly one of the meanings given architectural expression at the Great Mosque of Cordoba during the Caliphal period. The choice of royal wares as an alternate vehicle for conveying such a message speaks to the importance of material culture as agent of meaning. Objects worked in concert with their architectural settings in which they were used and displayed. To turn now to civic processions, even as the munyas took on new functions as luxurious containers for court people and events, it also became during the same moment a stage for civic ritual that was just as closely connected to an Umayyad message of authority. With the revival of the caliphate, another development in which the munyas were to become closely entwined was the movement of the sovereign and his court around the suburban landscape <coughs> of the capital city. The Andalusi caliphs moved between their urban palaces at Cordoba and at Medina Tazahra and their suburban munyas. These movements of the sovereign and his court became occasions for public spectacles as elaborate processions in and around Cordoba. During such occasions, the Umayyad caliph, shaded with a parasol of rich cloth, was accompanied not only by important members of his family and his court, but by flag bearers flying banners ornamented with eagle motifs, musicians playing drums and perhaps horns, and mounted Slav troops splendidly arrayed in special armor. Since the 9th century rule of Abd al-Rahman II, the Cordoban Umayyads generally shared in the conception of rulership and its articulation in court culture as defined by the Abbasids. While the court ceremonies of the Abbasids were set largely within the main public palaces of Samarra and Baghdad, the Fatimids moved court ritual into the streets of Cairo and beyond. Even incorporating the city's larger landscape into the realm of urban space by including the Nile within certain court rituals. In Cordoba, the Munya arguably, arguably became one of, if not the main theater of social and political life. When we consider the choices available to the Umayyads in the construction of the processional routes and the nodes within the built landscape which they would incorporate into civic rituals, it is striking that it is the munyas rather than the mosques that play the primary role of stage setting for the events of the Umayyad state. And this is not because Cordoba lacked mosques. On the court, uh, contrary, according to the chronicles, a number of large, luxurious, and popular mosques uh, had been constructed in and around Cordoba beginning in the ninth century by prominent women and eunuchs of the court, especially. But in some cases, uh, the gates of Munyas are specifically mentioned in the chronicle as the point of departure or the ceremonial goal of these processions. And so, uh, unfortunately, we don't have any uh, surviving standing uh, munya gates or portals, uh, but it is striking to me <coughs> that when we look at, say, this uh, doorway from the Cortijo del Alcaide site, um, this same formal language of doorways and portals we see um, in, uh, in these various spaces, whether they're munyas, 
uh, the urban palace or the great mosque itself. The special use of munya portals and ceremonial processions <coughs> implies that these munya gates acquired some meaning as symbols of authority and sovereignty. The civic ceremonies in which the munyas now played a role functioned as important collective rituals for the Umayyad state, which deployed these feasts, processions, and other occasions as public rituals meant to underscore the message of authority and caliphal legitimacy, which had taken on such importance with the declaration of the Andalusi Umayyad Caliphate. In Umayyad court culture, these processions were a means of ceremonially marking the dynasty's territory that affirmed a social and administrative order created by the ruler and in which the Munyas played such an integral role. <coughs> the function of such ceremonial thus offered a parallel to the architectural framing of panoramic landscape views at Madinata Zahra. Perhaps the most fundamental reason underlying the Munya's incorporation into such civic ceremonial, though, has to do with the suburban landscape that the estates largely defined and the meanings that this villa landscape held for the Cordoban sovereigns. As civic rituals, the processions shored up the Umayyad social system, propagating the myth of cultural unity and social continuity, which is one of the main functions of collective ritual. Certainly, the desire to underscore the Andalusi and Syrian Umayyad link as it was played out in the realm of meaningful landscapes and places is a thread that runs through the Andalusi Umayyad texts of the 10th century and certainly in the naming of the very first Umayyad uh, Munya as Rusafa after uh, the great um, Syrian Umayyad uh, estate. Um, it also plays out even earlier. The Munyas embody the fundamental connection between a flourishing landscape and ideals of good government, themes that are clearly expressed in Cordoban Umayyad texts, such as the calendar of Cordoba, and luxury objects such as the ivories. This concern is likewise reflected in Islamic philosophical texts of the same period that emphasize the connections between agriculture, the economy, and good government. Belief in a profound connection between rulership and agricultural fertility is discernible in medieval Islamic political and ethical philosophy, which distinguished between the realm of religion and of earthly matters related to good government. Agriculture was certainly a key source of the Andalusi sovereign's wealth, which was considerable. Al-Hakam II was rumored to have been uh, one of possibly the second uh, richest sovereign in all of the Dar al-Islam. And furthermore, as Hugh Kennedy has noted, the establishment of a sound fiscal policy which enabled the raising of state revenues was paramount to establishing the, legitim the legitimacy of Cordoban Umayyad rule. Agriculture and the wealth it produced for the Umayyad state and the aesthetic qualities attached to a bountiful landscape thus had great symbolic as well as pragmatic value. The connection between a bounteous landscape and political sovereignty similarly imbues literature produced during the long reign of Abdurrahman III. The ruler's ability to determine whether the state failed or flourished is expressed in epic poetry an unprecedented poetic form in Al-Andalus composed soon after the declaration of the Caliphate in 929. And that uh, ability of the ruler to determine whether the state was going to flourish or fail in these uh, works of epic poetry is always framed in terms of the flourishing or the devastation of the agricultural landscape. So in my talk today, I have tried to sketch a picture of the Cordoban Munyas as one of the striking features of the fertile river landscape just beyond the Umayyad capital city's walls, despite their present day invisibility in this same landscape. The Cordoban Munyas, and by extension the landscape within which they were disposed, thus functioned as a key part of the message about the nature of Umayyad rule. By the time Al-Hakam II took the throne as the second Andalusi Umayyad Caliph, the link between the Munya 
an Andalusi caliphal identity, authority, and legitimacy was tied in large part to the Munya landscape of Cordoba. While the old Umayyad palace within Cordoba's walled urban center and the new royal reception halls at Medina Tazahra served as the architectural emblems of the Umayyad rulers, the Munyas, which both palace and urban elites patronized by the late 10th century reign of Al-Hakam II, conveyed an unmistakable message about Umayyad sovereignty over the land to a broader audience than the aristocrats and courtiers who participated directly in social gatherings at the estates. As Munya patrons, the Cordoban Umayyad rulers' preoccupations with fertility and production and the ideological dimension of the creation of a flourishing landscape conveyed an unmistakable assertion of Andalusi good government, authority, and the rightness of their claim to the title of caliph. The incorporation of the estates into the official spheres of Umayyad court life, which occurred in the early years of the Andalusi caliphate, had the effect of marking Umayyad kingship on the landscape. Hence, villas became linked indelibly in the perception of the public audience who witnessed the associated ceremonies with the state. The Munya, situated within the broader panorama of Cordoba and its famously fertile lands, had become an embodiment in architecture and in landscape of Umayyad ideals of sovereignty. Thank you. <laughs>